Hello, I'm Mark Stefanini. I'm a senior associate in the Commercial Dispute Resolution Group at Mayor Brown, and I'm here with Patrick Hennessy. Hi, I'm Patrick Hennessy, a senior associate in the corporate team here at Mayor Brown. And today we're going to be talking about the duty of good faith in English law and recent case law in that area. Well, in a lot of civil law jurisdictions, and increasingly in common law jurisdictions such as the US, a duty of good faith is implied into contracts, in, in our, either in relation to the negotiation or the performance of those contracts. For example, in Germany, the civil code implies a duty of good faith in, both, in respect to both the performance and negotiation of contracts. The French civil code implies a, a duty in relation to the performance of contracts. And proposed legislation, such as the European sales law, um, is going to have an increasing impact on, on, on the position in English law. That's absolutely right, Mark. Uh, the English courts have been very reluctant to imply a, a duty of good faith in English contracts, primarily because it interferes with the negotiations and bargaining powers of the parties, and because the phrase is typically uncertain as to what it means. It's also very difficult to assess what sort of level of damages there would be if there was a breach of a good faith obligation. Yeah, the essential difficulty there is, is trying to show what would have happened had the parties negotiated in good faith, exactly. because there's always going to be an argument that despite the parties' best efforts to negotiate in good faith, no agreement would have been reached. And then a recent case, recent case law, in particular Yam Seng, um, has um, introduced the prospect that the English courts are going to imply duties of good faith into certain agreements which has created some uncertainty in terms of how future um, issues in this area are going to be decided. English law doesn't have a definition of good faith per se. Instead, it's assessed in each contractual circumstance and the background situation relevant to that contract. Cases have looked to try and define the parameters of what a good faith obligation would involve, such as have core meaning of honesty, fair dealing, uh, fidelity to a common purpose, or the, what would be the famous phrase of putting one card's face up on the table and playing fair. So, why, while English law has been reluctant to imply a general duty of good faith into all contracts, because of the effect that would have on the party's freedom of contract, it has, of course, sought to find um, solutions to potentially unfair situations which arise in, in contract. It's done this through several methods. Um, there are certain contracts under English law where a fiduciary relationship exists between the parties, such as contracts involving partners or agency contracts, and in those circumstances there is a duty of good faith owed. In addition, the courts are prepared to construe and interpret contracts in order to reach a sensible commercial result. Um, you know, construing harsh provisions strictly against parties seeking to rely on them. And also, doctrines such as promissory estoppel exist to try and make sure that parties don't mislead each other during the course of negotiations. So there are a number of ways that the English courts imply aspects of a duty of good faith into contracts without there being a general doctrine in that regard. But recent cases have suggested that there's going to be a change in the tide and that the courts will be willing to look at certain situations to determine whether a duty of good faith should be implied in that context. And there's two situations where the courts would look at good faith obligations, whether it's set out expressly or whether there's background circumstances that mean that a good faith obligation should be applicable to that contract. And we can talk about those cases now. So if we start to consider express obligations of good faith that have been set out in contracts and how they've been interpreted by the courts, one case that's relevant in this situation is the Compass Group and Mid-Essex case, or the Medaris case, as it's otherwise known. And that involved a contract between Compass the supplier and an NHS trust, essentially, that allowed the trust to award itself service failure points for the delivery by the supplier of certain foodstuffs that were not up to standard. And then those cert certain service failure points allowed the trust to then terminate the contract. And so the decision was whether the, the, the award of the uh, service failure points and the, and the uh, right to terminate should have been dealt with in good faith. 
Yeah, and, and this is a court of appeal case, so it's the, it's the leading authority on express duties of good faith. And, and where the court of appeal got to on this was that they did think that the outcome of the service failure points resulted in excessive deduction. Um, but they looked at the clause and they construed it quite narrowly and they said that the duty of good faith was limited to the two specific objects set out in that clause, which were the transmission of information and the enabling um, the, the NHS to derive the full benefit of the contract. And the Court of Appeal was at pains to point out in that case that these sort of duties contained in one particular clause, the court should be very reluctant to imply that that sort of duty um, should have a broader scope than expressly set out in the clause. And, and the reasoning for that is that um, you know, where the parties have provided expressly in another clause for payment of um, a certain amount per failure point, there's no reason to suppose that they intended the duty of good faith to apply to that second clause. If they had, they would have made it clear in the drafting. So that, that's the current position. And, and, yeah, exactly, and so the trust was then able to terminate in accordance with the contract, there was no other obligations that are imposed on the on the trust to be able to it, for it to be able to terminate the contract. And following on from that, another case that included an express obligation of good faith is the TSG in South Anglia case. That contract concerned the provision of gas services by TSG to South Anglia in respect of its housing stock. The contract was for a four-year period, but included an express right to terminate for any reason or even for no reason at any time. The, the, the court had to consider whether the termination of the contract should have been performed in good faith. And as in Medirest, the court adopted the approach of starting from the fact that the parties had drafted a clause which contained an express obligation entitling um, them to terminate on notice. Um, and it considered whether the, the duty of good faith should, in essence, you know, be, be an overlay to that clause and decided that in fact it shouldn't. Um, had the parties intended that clause to be subject to a duty of good faith, they would no doubt have provided for it in, expressly in the contract. And that was followed in the subsequent case of Greenclose and NatWest, under which NatWest basically extended the term of the contract by a two-year period and it was held that it was fully entitled to do so without consideration to uh, any other factors or good faith factors because that is what the express uh, terms of the contract said and it acted in accordance with that contract. So another interesting case in this area is Fujitsu and IBM. Um, and this was a case where Fujitsu had subcontracted to perform work for IBM under a head contract. And essentially IBM didn't provide Fujitsu with the work that had been anticipated when they contracted. And the contract between the two contained an exclusion clause which excluded liability for loss of profit. So Fujitsu brought a claim on the basis that IBM's failure to allocate them work was in breach of a, a, an express duty of good faith contained in the contract. Yes, and, and the court actually held that there was no express duty of good faith in the contract. Instead, Fujitsu were just warranting the performance of the services in accordance with the contract and nothing more. Uh, the court found that in respect of the partnership, partnership principles that had been set out in the contract, they were more aspirational and motivational rather than anything certain and contractual in, in, in relation to the good faith obligations. And so the, co the court obviously construed that clause narrowly, as other cases have demonstrated, to apply it to the circumstances of this case and exclude any obligation of good faith in that situation. So looking back at those cases, um, I think there are a few points to take away. Um, firstly, that the courts are going to look at um, express duties of good faith quite narrowly and are going to be very reluctant to imply a duty of good faith relating to a particular aspect of performance um, as, as creating a wider duty to perform the contract in good faith. Secondly, cases such as the IBM case mm. illustrate that where you have quite a nebulous concept of good faith involved in the contract, the courts may take the view that that is simply too uncertain mm. 
to form the basis of an, an express requirement of, of good faith. Exactly, and then so just to pick up on that, I think what, what the takeaway point on this is if you're going to include an express obligation of good faith in your contract, you make, make sure it's narrowly or defined and it's clear as to what that relates to in, in respect to the contract. Absolutely. So with that in mind, let's talk about um, implied duties and Yam Sang, which yep. is you know, the case that really is causing so much fuss in this area. Yeah, so Yam Sang is an interesting case because the narrow approach taken to expressed terms included in contracts in respect of good faith sits uneasy with the decision in Yam Sang. Yam Seng concerned a distribution contract under which Yam Seng were to distribute Man United type fragrances and other toiletries uh, throughout uh, the prescribed region. And the dispute ar arose as to uh, the rights to terminate the contract. Yam Seng claimed that ITC had provided information that was false and so it had relied on this false information in marketing the products and also that ITC had, uh, had conducted sales at lower than the duty-free prices that Yam Seng had contracted to under its contract. And the judge in this case, Mr Justice Leggett, um, took the view that the English um, reluctance to impose a duty of good faith was misplaced. Yep. And in quite a detailed judgment, he set out various aspects of a duty of good faith which are commonly implied into um, English law agreements, and these include things such as a duty to act honestly um, and fidelity to the party's bargain in terms of what would the parties, what, what standards of behaviour would the parties have expected each other to observe at the time of contracting. And this ties in with the test for implied terms, the Belize test, and the fact that, um, you know, the object of construing a contract is to look at what the words written would mean in the relevant commercial context. When looking at the tests as to whether a term should be implied in, into a contract, there's two typical things that are considered. And that the first one is, is it so obvious that it should be included, that term should be included, and that's what the parties intended should be included and form part of that contract. And the other is, is it necessary to give business efficacy to the contract? Would the contract work without that, con without that contractual term being included? So Mr Justice Leggett took those tests to look at the contract in Yam Seng to determine whether a good faith obligation or an obligation not to be dishonest in, in providing information should be interpreted into, in, in this contract and what that meant in the circumstances. Yeah, and, and where he got to was implying a series of um, obligations into the contract that, that, that make up aspects of a duty of good faith and finding that in fact um, ITC did provide inaccurate information to Yam Seng and that that was a breach of the relevant contract. Exactly. So when he was looking at this contract, he was saying, what does good faith mean in this situation? He was saying a core meaning of good faith includes honesty, so there's an honest uh, delivery of financial information and other information to Yam Seng that it would re rely on, as well as other commercial standards that should be taken into consideration. And what would the parties expect to it be included in this type of arrangement? And that's really how he got around the traditional objections to a good faith obligation, is he said that I'm not implying a good faith obligation here. What I'm doing is I'm reading the contract, I'm thinking about what the parties would have intended and how they would have expected each other to behave, and I'm simply providing for them to behave in that manner. So there's no necessary uncertainty surrounding an obligation of good faith because it means what the parties intended it to mean, like so many other um, contractual terms. It, it falls to be interpreted on the facts of the particular case. And it's interesting, the follow-on from Yam Seng and how that impacted in the courts. When we look at the Medares case, as we discussed, the Court of Appeal made reference to Yam Seng, but suggested that despite Yam Seng, there's no general doctrine of good faith in English law, and that is the default position. However, the Court of Appeal didn't overrule Yam Seng as being bad law, and it, and it was defined as being specific to its circumstances, essentially. Yeah, and a, a subsequent case called Bristol Ground School demonstrates that the courts are still prepared to imply a duty of good faith um, in light of the decision in Yam Seng.
um, despite the Court of Appeal's comments in Medarest. But the key difference b between these cases is the fact that in Medarest, the, the contract was more complete. It was a complex arrangement that had been fully negotiated between the parties. It was split over a number of documents and the court felt there was no need to imply the sort of uh, other arrangements and, uh, and terms that had been considered in these other cases, including Yam Seng. So I think where that leaves us is where you have a relational contract, you have to consider whether there's likely to be the implication of a duty of good faith. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a couple of other cases that are worthy of mention in this context. Um, the court declined to imply a duty of good faith in relation to the negotiation as opposed to the performance of a contract and confirmed that the default position under English law was that there was no such duty. However, the judge did um, obiter comment that he thought it might be possible in some circumstances for the parties to contract out of this presumption, for example by entering into a separate agreement that said they would negotiate in good faith and should those negotiations prove unsuccessful, you know, one party would pay the costs associated with, with, with the negotiations. Yeah, and along the same sort of lines about negotiations is the Emirates case, which included an obligation on the parties to engage in friendly discussions before seeking arbitration in, in respect of any disputes. And in that case, the court found that the, the clause itself was pretty certain and, and defined. The, the, the parties had a four-week period in which to engage in these uh, friendly discussions. And because it was not missing any key elements, the, the court found that that was fully enforceable and that the, the parties should be uh, engaging in good faith and that, that that test had been satisfied. So the case is interesting because essentially the court found that there's a difference between negotiating uh, before co a contract and an, uh, interpreting a, a, an obligation to negotiate that's contained in an express obligation in, 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 the, in the contract itself. It'd be interesting to see if this case is followed by other cases because the court relied quite heavily on the courts of New South Wales in Australia as being decisive in this area and so English courts may be reluctant to be see, to, to, to treat this case as being definitive on this point. So in conclusion I think there are a few points to take away. Firstly obligations of good faith are enforceable in the English courts in certain circumstances. Express obligations of good faith contained in contracts are likely to be construed narrowly in the context in which they're written. And there is room for implied obligations of good faith, particularly in relation to relational contracts. So tips to take away. Specifically excluding uh, on obligation to act in good faith isn't necessarily constructive to negotiations and the practicalities of trying to agree that may be harmful. But there are steps that parties can take to try and uh, avoid a situation where good faith is uh, imposed onto the contract, like looking at the entire agreement clause and what that covers or excludes. For those looking to include and express obligation of good faith, it's important to ensure that the scope is sufficiently uh, set out and what that obligation applies to in respect of the contract, leaving, uh, leaving the contract to be clear as to what the parties intend uh, the outcome of that good faith obligation to be. And the other thing to think about is to ensure that the contract is sufficiently negotiated and thorough to ensure that the courts don't have scope to fill the gaps, essentially, and imply terms that shouldn't be implied or within the contemplation of the parties at the time that they are negotiating and concluding the contract. If anything in this talk strikes a chord, don't forget to take legal advice on your particular circumstances. Details of how to contact Paddy and myself are available on the website. <laughs>